Hello, welcome back to Bamboo Batu on YouTube. Uh, today we're addressing another frequently asked question about growing bamboo from seeds versus growing bamboo from cuttings. And uh, just a quick reminder before we jump into it, if you enjoy these videos and the content I'm making, please subscribe to the channel. Also, if you want to know more about bamboo, check out bamboobatu.com. That's my website. It's been up for about uh, 15 years. It's been there for a long time. I've got hundreds of free articles about all sorts of topics related to bamboo, growing bamboo, using bamboo, deriving uh, ecological benefits from bamboo. Um, we're crazy about bamboo and we want the world to know about it. So check it out. And let's get into it. Uh, what's the best way to propagate bamboo? So that's a commonly asked question. If there were an easy answer to the question, people probably wouldn't ask it so much because they would all know, but it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, a lot of people want to grow bamboo from seeds and some people think it's a good idea. Some people don't. Um, this is what, uh, bamboo sometimes looks like when it flowers. Bamboo does not flower very often. Bamboo is a perennial grass. Uh, as opposed to an annual grass, annual grasses like wheat and corn and sorghum, stuff like that. They flower at the end of the year and they die and then you have to replant them. Uh, bamboo is a perennial. That means uh, it grows and it just keeps on growing uh, year after year after year. And in, it varies from species to species. But most species of bamboo, it takes, um, could take 20 or 30 or 40 years before they flower. In some cases, more than a hundred years, um, between flowering. And in many or most cases, the bamboo will, will die off when it flowers. Um, the whole plant goes uh, into flower, then it goes to seed. And then the vegetative growth sort of peters out and all the energy goes into the flowers and the seeds. And at that time, you better collect all the seeds. Uh, in some cases, many cases, all of the all of the specimens of a given species will flower at the same time. That's called gregarious flowering, which is a real interesting thing. Uh, I've got some articles about that on my website, but basically, um, yeah, all of the bamboo flowers at once in certain species, regardless of where in the world they are. So recently. Um, around 2020, between 2020 and 22 ish, um, all of the Phyllostachys nigra were flowering all over the world. And so that included a typical black bamboo, uh, Phyllostachys nigra, and also this, uh, the subspecies of Phyllostachys nigra, including Henan, Henan, um, the timber bamboo that grows really well in the U S it's real popular, um, big bamboo that grows a lot down in the Southeast. Uh, they were all flowering also. And then there's some other, uh, subspecies of that too, some different exotic cultivars and they're all flowering at the same time. And in most cases, the plants were dying, but not always. Um, seems like the, if it was, a if it was too young or too old, it would probably die. But if it was, you know, a good healthy plant and not too old, it maybe stood a better chance. Um, it's pretty, pretty, uh, crazy how this happens. Um, but at that time you want to collect all the seeds because, um, if your plants are all dying and everyone else's plants of that species are dying, then everybody's going to have to replant. And so those seeds become uh, pretty precious. And so that is one of the issues of some growing seeds is that they're a little bit hard to gather. Um, this is a handful or a pile of bamboo seeds, not sure what species it is. Um, so yeah, it's hard to get the seeds because the plants flower so infrequently. And then uh, when they do flower, um, you get a big batch of seeds and they're very, um, nondescript. It's really impossible to recognize what species of bamboo this is from the seeds. Um, I sure can't identify it. There could be some, some expert, um, bamboo farmer in China or India, maybe that we could look at it and tell me what species it is, but I highly doubt that. And even if the seeds are labeled a certain species by someone, it's still not, um, totally reliable. And that's another problem with seeds. 
um, reliable identification of the species. And then there's a shelf life also on the, on the bamboo seeds. Um, you can only store them for so long before they're not, not so reliable anymore. So, um, it's, it's fun to grow plants from seed, but it's, it's a tricky thing with bamboo. Um, these are some seedlings, uh, a friend of mine sprouted these, um, some different species. He ordered some seeds online from a company in Germany, I think. Uh, it's a friend of mine who lives in Germany and I kind of, I discouraged him and told him, you know what? It's pretty risky buying seeds online for bamboo because you don't know what's going to crop up. You don't know what's going to sprout, but as long as you're not spending too much money on it, um, and you're not planning, you know, 300 acres of bamboo and using, uh, unpredictable seeds, you know, if you're just growing a small batch like this, then yeah, for sure. Go for it and see what comes up. Even if the species is not the species you expected, um, you could get something interesting. Uh, and again, as long as you're not spending too much money on it and you're comfortable with that risk, then go for it. Uh, these are some bamboo seedlings sprouted successfully. Uh, someone else I know, this is in Kenya. Um, and as you can see on that little sign that he made there, this is D asper, Dendrocalamus asper, also known as giant bamboo. Uh, there's quite a few species that they call giant bamboo because it's, you know, it's kind of a generic term, but it's an apt description of bamboo that grows, you know, 50, 60, 80 feet tall. And asper is one of the most popular species of bamboo for commercial cultivation for, for timber. Um, it grows very well in the tropics. Uh, it grows huge, it grows very thick and goes straight. The clumps are, um, pretty dense, manageable. And, um, apparently there's, um, an adequate supply of seeds out there. Some people can sprout many, many seeds, uh, as, as this gentleman did on his, uh, in his nursery in Kenya. Uh, something else that might crop up and plant seeds is something that looks like this plant, uh, something called a bamboo seed. And you get this, which looks like grass and bamboo is a grass, but this grass is not bamboo. And I have seen a few examples of this. Um, most memorably, I think there was a, uh, Facebook post somewhere that I saw someone asking, Hey, what, uh, what species of bamboo do you think this is? And, um, unfortunately I couldn't find that picture, but the picture looks something like this, something that was clearly not bamboo. And it's, uh, you know, for the, for the beginner grower and for many growers, the seed sprouts up, you get something green. You're like, Hey, my bamboo is growing. And, um, it might take, uh, it might take a few days, a few weeks, a few months even to realize, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not bamboo. Um, and this is not bamboo. Sorry about that. But unfortunately that happens, uh, when you're ordering seeds, um, from out of the country. Um, speaking of growing seeds from out of the country, it's actually illegal to, um, order seeds from out of the country and have them imported, uh, without special uh, license and permission from the department of agriculture, I think. So not that they enforce that super strictly on, um, small, you know, gardeners, but it is something I have heard. Uh, I have heard of people having the, uh, department of agriculture or the USDA or some other federal agency show up at their house and say, Hey, remember those seeds you ordered on the internet? Uh, yes, please hand them over. So that does happen. And usually they get off with a warning, but it's still uh, a risk to be aware of. Um, the importation of exotic plants and seeds is, um, pretty highly regulated in the United States and in most countries, um, especially like island countries. If you live in Hawaii or you live in Puerto Rico or, um, some country that's, that's on an island, um, they are very careful about what gets imported, uh, what kind of plants get imported onto the island because of the potential for exotic invasive species to to crowd out the local species on their island. Something to be aware of. Um, having said that, there's also, you know, many success stories with bamboo seeds. Uh, here's a, a row of little bamboo seedlings looking great. So some of the pros and cons, just to recap, um, 
bamboo seeds are very, very slow to develop. Uh, when you sprout the seeds, you need to be pretty patient. It could take a while for the, for the sprouts to come up, for the, for the shoots to start getting tall and the leaves to come off. And in the first year, you might get something that looks like this in the picture. And you have to wait for the second year to get, to get poles that are, or stems that are a little bit bigger. Uh, you wouldn't even call this a pole, you know, in this case. Um, I don't know what species this is in the picture, but in six or seven years, this little bamboo plant could be producing poles that are huge. That could be five or six inches in diameter, but that's going to take several years for the plant to mature and reach that, that size. Um, so that's something to be aware of the slowness and, uh, and difficulty of, of just sprouting and propagating the seeds. Um, um, many amateur gardeners have find that pretty challenging. Uh, and then there's the unreliable supply of seeds. Uh, like I talked about, it's hard to get them because the plants flower so infrequently, and then they're not always labeled correctly. People lose track. Um, it could just be an honest mistake. It could be, you know, dishonest, um, false marketing, false advertising, and they could also be old and just not as virile. Phenotypic variation is an interesting thing. When you grow from seed, um, they're all going to be the same. Theoretically, if you have a bag of seeds from a certain species, um, all of those seeds, all those plants will grow up to be the same species. Um, but that does not mean they will be identical plants, just like you and I are the same species. We are not identical um, as far as I know. Um, lucky for us probably that we're not, but, um, there are pros and cons to that. If you're gardening and all your plants are identical, there's some predictability, um, of having that regularity of, and consistency in your plants. They all need the same, have the same requirements, need the same treatment, but it also means they're, they're going to be susceptible or vulnerable to the same problems. Like if you have a fungus or some other pest that attacks your bamboo. If it likes one of your bamboos and all of your bamboos are genetically identical because they're grown from clones, then, then the, the fungus or the pest that, that likes one of your bamboo plants will like all of your bamboo plants. And that could be bad news. So the phenotypic variation means that you're going to have a little more diversity, um, which could be more interesting. And it also gives you a little more resilience as far as being resistant to, to pests and diseases and different things that could, um, that could attack your bamboo. Um, and just biodiversity in general is, is a good thing, I believe. And also when you grow from seed with that, with that variation, you're going to end up, um, some plants are going to be more vigorous than others. Uh, and there might be a couple stands out, stand out, uh, plants. If you plant like a hundred seeds or a thousand seeds, you might have a, like an average that's pretty good. You might have a few that just don't sprout or that just aren't very healthy at all. And you might have a few that are just exceptional, super vigorous, super strong, super fast growing, uh, just certain characteristics, uh, just like in a litter of, of animals, you know, um, let's say your dog has, a has eight puppies, you know, there's going to be a runt in the litter and there might be one or two that are like the alpha, alpha puppies. And so you can select out those alpha puppies of your bamboo and then take clones or uh, propagate those, um, by, uh, by other means like stem cuttings or root divisions, and then propagate that and then replicate those, those exact, um, genetics. So that's kind of a cool thing that you can do. Um, back to the list here. Um, so some another, other advantages growing from seed, um, you tend to get more vigorous plants. Um, you're growing from, you're starting from, from like a timeline of uh, time zero because you don't have, um, a plant cutting. If you, if you propagate a plant that's 10 years old, then your cutting is basically a 10 year old. You're starting a brand new plant, but it's already 10 years old from, from day one. And that could mean that it's going to flower soon. You don't know if you take a cutting, if you took a cutting from a plant that's already 25, 30 years old, um, it could be a really healthy plant, but it could be coming up to flowering time. And so your brand new cutting 
Um, you take cuttings, you know, say you take a hundred cuttings from this plant, um, cover a field with it. And then, you know, just two or three years down the road, they all go to flower and die. Um, that could be a real disappointment. So growing from seed, you don't have that issue. Um, they will flower. Uh, they won't flower until the natural time of flowering, which could be, uh, could be many, many years, could be decades, or like I said, it could be 60 or 80, hundred years before they flower. And that depends on the species. Uh, so the other way to propagate, if you're not growing from seed, most commonly is going to be stem cuttings. Um, as you see here, these stems, this is Bambusa vulgaris, super vigorous species. It grows all over the tropics. You find it growing throughout Africa, Central America, Asia, Pacific islands, and it just grows like crazy. Bambusa vulgaris, uh, basically is Latin for common bamboo. And it is common because it is such a vigorous grower. Uh, you can throw a couple stems on the ground and they just start to grow. Uh, people take poles, they harvest poles and they'll build a little, uh, build a little shed or a shack or something and stand some poles in the dirt and they'll come back a couple months later. And those poles that are supposed to be holding up, uh, a little lean to shed, uh, are, are starting to sprout. Um, even though they don't want them to sprout, they're trying to use it as a building material, but their, their walls start to come to life. And that's how vigorous it is. Uh, here's another example. Um, this is also, uh, Bambusa vulgaris. I believe this photo is from Mozambique, uh, another great place for bamboo farming. Um, so the advantages of this method are the, it is pretty quick to develop, uh, especially with this species. Uh, you take some cuttings they start to grow. Uh, in the, in this picture here, um, you see that all the sprouts come up at the nodes. And what they would do is, you know, once they get all these sprouts coming up, they could, um, you know, they would, they would bury these poles first, uh, all the sprouts would come up at the nodes and then you would go back in and, and separate, um, uh, separate those, those segments of bamboo and have a separate plant, uh, with each of those nodes. So you could get, you know, looks like something like 30 or 40 or 50 bamboo plants or more from this, from this collection of poles. Uh, buried in the sand. Pretty cool technique. Um, very high success rate. Uh, again, that depends on the species a certain uh, exotic species of bambusa. I've heard people have a really hard time propagating, um, but other varieties, tropical bamboo, clumping bamboo, uh, is very effective to propagate with this, this method. And so it's high success, success rate. Uh, you get this consistency, which like I said, could be a good thing. Uh, but there could be drawbacks to having, you know, too much consistency when you have genetic, um, duplicates of, uh, all from the same plant. Uh, but in this case, you can see all those different poles They could have come from different plants, which is going to provide you with a little bit more, uh, genetic diversity, hopefully. Um, and there's the biological clock. Like I said, the, the flowering time. Um, depending on the age of the original plants that these cuttings were taken from, that will determine when this plant is going to flower. Uh, with Bambusa vulgaris, I believe that when it flowers, it continues to grow vegetatively. It's not a species that flowers and dies off, so that would not be an issue as far as I understand uh, with this species, but in general, uh, something to be aware of. So before you propagate, uh, with this method, um, read up on the species and the flowering periods and things like that. Um, and then, uh, the homogeneity, again, that's just the flip side of consistency. Consistency kind of has a positive connotation. Like all the plants are the same. They have the same requirements. Homogeneity is more focused on the negative aspects, which is that, um, if you have all these genetic duplicates, then they will be, uh, vulnerable to the same pests and other, um, factors. So pros and cons of, uh, cuttings. And then the, the thing that people are really into these days is tissue culture. If you're farming on a, on a large scale, that is, which is becoming an interesting, uh, idea for many bamboo growers, uh, for reforestation methods or for, for pulp production or, uh, lumber production, um, large scale bamboo farmers are doing tissue culture. This is, um, for massive scale, you can take just a little 
tiny piece of bamboo and just re reproduce it on an almost like a cellular level. And you just separate these, you know, tiny little bits of, of tissue and each of those little pieces of tissue sprouts into a new plant. So you can start with a pretty small, uh, pretty small supply and multiply it out by the thousands. Uh, and this is Dendrocalamus brandisi, another tropical uh, timber bamboo. Uh, I think it's native to India. Um, and they do a lot of this in India. Uh, it's also, there's a few places in Indonesia and the Philippines where they're doing tissue culture. And there's, uh, I think there's a company in Florida doing some tissue culture too. So it's, it's a tricky thing to do. It requires some, some great skill and expertise and some expensive lab equipment, uh, but it does allow you to propagate on an enormous scale. And again, if you're each, you know, each batch that's grown from the same plant will be very consistent, which has its pro has its own pros and cons. Uh, the consistency, like we said, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You get the predictability, but also the, the vulnerability with that. Um, so if you're doing tissue culture, you want to have multiple, um, plant stock that you're replicating and not just produce a million copies of the same DNA, uh, cause that's risky. It's better to diversify. I always recommend biodiversity. And lastly, there's the availability. Um, the people that are using, um, tissue culture are ordering massive uh, quantities of these plants because they're produced on a massive scale. And so if you have say a thousand acres, 2000 acres, do you want to plant with bamboo? You order from one of these labs and they stock, you know, they have millions of seedlings in their greenhouses, but one customer could buy like a million plants at a time. And so usually you do need to pre-order and it could take several months to get, uh, to get these. And if you want to set up your own lab, that could also take several months or more to develop the expertise uh, that's necessary to do this successfully. Um, this video is running a little bit longer than usual, but there's so much to say about uh, bamboo propagation. This one last thing, uh, this is the method most people, uh, hobby farmers, uh, hard, um, hobbyist gardeners are familiar with, and that's just the basic root rhizome division. You have uh, in the picture here, you see all these, uh, these big, big clumps of bamboo, I think it's actually running bamboo, but, um, they've been potted and they're removed from their pots and you can see how they're a bit root bound and those, um, root balls need to be divided periodically, um, which is a pretty straightforward thing to do. You can see that chainsaw in the picture. If you have big pots like this, looks like they probably came out of wine barrels. This photo is from a nursery in wine country, California, uh, Sonoma, I believe. And so they have a lot of these wine barrels and they cut them in half and they're great for gardening and good for a big bamboo plant. Um, but eventually the bamboo will get root bound. And so you need to break it up. It's an easy thing to do. It's a necessary thing to do. Um, it's the most common way to, uh, propagate running bamboo, uh, where the rhizomes are all stretched out and, and leggy. Uh, you can cut the, cut the rhizomes and, uh, very high success rate with that for most running bamboo species. And again, you get the consistency. Every, every plant is going to be identical to the mother plant. The main drawback here is it's great for gardeners. If you have a few plants and you want to make a few more plants or give your neighbors and friends a housewarming present or, you know, a new bamboo plant. But if you're trying to grow a bamboo farm and you want to cover acres with bamboo, this is a pretty slow way to do it. Um, you know, one of these plants, you could cut it into make it from one plant into four plants, maybe five plants. Um, but yeah, it's, it's time consuming and it's pretty messy cutting through these roots. And there's the chainsaw that they use here, depending how big your plant is, you can use smaller tools maybe, but yeah. Anyway, that just about wraps it up. Um, hope you found that interesting, fascinating and informative. Again, uh, subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. Tell your friends, make Bambi Batu your new favorite. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening.